present here today. And in my career, it's been a pleasure to work with and know a lot of very talented people. And one way to resolve the generosity is also ask, are they also the nice guys you would like to hang out with? And as such, near the top of the list of people I like to be with, that makes it very special. And the proximity effect is the people who come to his birthday are also some of my favorite people. So I'm very glad to see all of you here. And I want to thank the young guys, the organizers, for doing this. Uh, so I've been competing with uh, Steve Kirilson and Dan. So I thought I should have a, something even better than Steve on what I stuff like on his night models that we have interest to him. <laughs> All right, uh, now for the real talk. So here is a topological 
system, in this case happens to be a topological superconductor. It's going to be this P plus IP superconductor. Like all topological systems, it has the property that when you truncate it with an edge, there will be modes at the edge, and the edge modes have some special properties. For example, uh, what you find on the edge, you will never find in the bulk in isolation. It has to be the edge of something to do what it does here. And here, in this case, they will be traveling in one direction. Sometimes it's only one spin, and sometimes uh, it may be a Majorana fermion, even though the bulk and Dirac fermion. But it's got some edge. So there is life at the edge that consists of particles propagating along the edge. That's what I've shown with this red arrow. Measured perpendicular to the plane in which the sample lives is time, Euclidean time. So the particles on the edge move in Euclidean time and they define a scale invariant field theory here. And the quantities that I say are equal are the wave function of the Schrodinger like non relativistic wave function of the fermions that form the superconductor and the field theory correlation functions of the fermions on the edge. One is the function of the coordinate on the plane, on the x1, x2 plane. Other is the function of space time, x1, x3. And they happen to be the same function. So it's not simply they are connected in some way, it's the very same function that enters in both places. And what's remarkable about this one is that it is not really due to the formal invariance usual way in which you connect the bulk of the edge is due to Lorentz invariance. And to prove the point, I will show you later examples in 3 plus 1b where it happens. So the question is, how do these things become equal? So that's the claim. The way you take some points on the plane, and you find some many-body wave function with the red dots, and you take some points on the Euclidean space-time with the same coordinates, but now measured in that plane, and the functions are the same. So this is the claim. So it is, the surprising thing is that one is the Schrodinger like wave function and one is the time ordered product of expectation value products of operators in the quantum field theory and the same function arises in both. So this is going to tell you in one picture how it is done. So if you follow that, that's enough. The rest are all details. So suppose your goal is to find the wave function of the system at a certain time. That is shown by the time slice x3 equal to 0. So the particles are trapped yet. Yeah, I will show you in a minute. It's, it's a Pathian wave function. It's Pathian. So I have all these particles traveling in Euclidean time. They are part of the superconductor. <laughs> And at some point, I have to stop them and measure their position. So what should I do? I build a wall, a big wall. <laughs> I make the electrons pay for it. <laughs> that's what I do. That's, that's where all the measurement is done. I'm going to show you how it's done. But in the end, what I deal with is not just the wave function for 10 electrons but the generating function of all possible wave functions with any number of particles. So this function z of j that I'm calculating, not the wave function, its various j derivatives will give me the various correlation functions. And I will show you that that z of j can be written as a path integral in imaginary time, going from distant past where chemical potential at one sign to the distant future where it jumps very abruptly from a positive value to highly negative value. So that path integral, when evaluated, will give me as its derivatives all the correlation functions, all the wave functions. Then, because it's a path integral, there is some action. And in this problem, the action happens to be a Lorentz invariant. Using the fact, you can tilt the system on its side and get what you have here. And the tilted system has got the same Hamiltonian, except for a Lorentz rotation, but in that picture, it looks like the barrier in chemical potential is in the spatial direction. 
and the edge is now a real edge in real space. So this prescription doesn't involve anything topological yet? No. In fact, it, you know, most topological things don't even care what the Hamiltonian is. But it, here it depends on a particular Hamiltonian having a particular symmetry. That you can do a lot of rotation and get the rotated theory. And the rotated theory, you can see, one has a jump in the chemical potential in time, other is like a jump in the potential in space. And one has a, something funny at a certain time, one thing has an edge in real space. So your statement holds for any Lorentz invariant? Uh, in any Lorentz invariant theory, you will be able to show that something is equal to something else, but maybe related but not equal to. I don't know what will happen. There are other problems where, I will show you in some cases where the rotated problem may not even be the uh, same kind of problem you're interested in. But you can always get the answer to a different problem by rotating. Why is the first time a part function? Pardon me? Why is the left figure a bulk wave function? Yes, I'm going to show that now. But the image you want to carry, I'll do all the details now, but the image you want to carry in your head is that there's a way to write the wave function uh, of any number of particles as a source derivative of a functional integral. And that functional integral, because you put it in rotation invariant, you can rotate and get some other problem. And you can show the derivatives now will give you the uh, wave function of the particles on the edge. So, so, so I, don't, I, don't, I don't get the difference between A and B. A, you have two spatial directions and one you in time. Right. In the other one also, you have a time. In B, you have three spatial directions? No, no, no. Both have three directions, right? We can see one. In the first case, you have x1, x2 plane where the particles live, and they move in Euclidean time, x3. In Euclidean space, you can do rotation. Then after the rotation, x3 becomes a spatial direction, and this abrupt change in potential becomes an edge. And then the x1 direction becomes the time for the new problem. The edge modes now live in the x2, x1 plane, in the rotated problem. And the same so as j, when we differentiate it now, will give you the correlation functions of the field theory. On the left-hand side, the source, when differentiated, will give you the so wave functions the of the many is between 2D, I mean, in this example. It's between 3D and 3D. 2D and the edge of a 3D bulk. No, no, no. The whole thing is 3D. <coughs> when it's 2D, real system with the one-dimensional edge, or 2D system with time in the third direction, they're both 3D system. You can only rotate a 3D system to another 3D system. What you've done is rotated what used to be a time direction for one guy into the space direction for the other guy, and what used to be a space into the time for the other guy. Anyway, let's see the details now. Uh, you can see what happens. So this is called Fafians. For those who know anything about Fafians, I didn't like them too much, but now I cannot live without them. So these are really, <laughs> these are really uh, Dirac like integrals, except everywhere you thought you get a determinant, you get a path. And it's a very nice way to do the BCS wave functions. So this is the P plus IP Hamiltonian. The P plus IP Hamiltonian, um, yes. So this we recognize in the in momentum space with a Hamiltonian of a C and a C dagger. And this is the C C and C dagger, C dagger, pair in general. And it's called P plus IP because of this momentum dependence. And it could have dependence on K squared, but I'm treating them as constants. So delta and delta star are constants. This is the essential uh, P plus IP character of the wave function. Look at the diagonal terms. Uh, first of all, we got terms of zero powers of K if we're doing low energy physics. We got one power of K you need to define its P plus IP. You might say, What's the need for the k squared? Some of you may know, and some of you I didn't know in those days what it was all about. This makes sure that if you go to very, very large k, this is fermions in the continuum. Uh, they have an ordinary Fermi surface. If you go to very large k, this Hamiltonian looks like sigma z times k squared. And therefore, the ground state will point down. So ignore this one, this is wrong. It looks like 0, 1 at k goes infinity. When k goes to 0, again, you forget these guys. These guys don't get any respect, either big k or large k. They are just 
they define the tensor structure. But then is at zero, okay, you forget these guys, and this looks like minus mu plus mu, that looks like minus sigma z, and the spinner will point down. So in that case, at infinity, you point one way, and you at origin, you point the other way, you've covered the whole sphere, you got a non-trivial winding number. If mu has the wrong sign, then uh, it doesn't cover the sphere, there is no topology, it's not a topology. This is a lot of it, just uh, green and green. Yeah. All right. So this is the superconductor we are studying. So I want you to imagine for what's coming next, we are going to write this Hamiltonian in real space. In real space, this will be like d by dx, d by dy, and so on. So here's what it looks like in real space. Uh, before I do that, I'm giving you the answer to how does something become a path integral. If you want the wave function for any system, you take the you take the state you have, you destroy electrons at these end locations, and you project on the vacuum. And you get a non-zero answer only if you hit the place where there are electrons, and that will be proportional to the amplitude to be there, and that therefore the wave function. This is just a standard way to extract an n particle wave function from a many body state. This need not be a state with definite number of particles, it can contain any number of them. So that if you rather than look at a particular wave function of n particles, you can take a generating function of any number of particles if you can evaluate this. So then you take the derivative with respect to j 15 times, you will get the 15 particle wave function. Now, look at the left and the bra and the ket. The ket is the BCS wave function, P plus IP wave function. You can write that as starting with some initial state, it's pretty much arbitrary. Letting it evolve in time under the DDG Hamiltonian from minus infinity to zero minus will automatically turn into the ground state by the loss of Euclidean quantum mechanics. So this one can be written as starting at some arbitrary state with the propagator from minus infinity to zero. At zero time, you insert this operator. And this one has got to be the trivial state because it's got to be the vacuum. For that, you start with any random future state evolve from infinity to zero using Hamiltonian with a very large mu, large negative mu. That will force it to be the empty state. So this whole thing is really a, a path integral starting somewhere and ending somewhere. It doesn't matter very much. That's the propagator, minus infinity to zero, a measurement process, and then from zero to infinity. This has got mu, which is very positive. This has got mu, which is very negative. That's what we are doing. Not the same you? So you and you. you. Well, the, the you propagator you mean? No, this propagator is a propagator that knows what the correct mu is that you should use. You should use the mu appropriate to having some number of fermions in the system. So that will be a positive mu. This will be a state with no fermions with a very large mu. So it's not this. Do you mean I and F? It doesn't really matter. Uh, in Euclidean theory, you can take any state you want. As long as there's some non-zero overlap with the ground state, it won't matter. It will cancel out and everything. So now for the details, this is our Hamiltonian. This is the Kx and Iky guys written in real space. Uh, this is the chemical potential. And you've got to take the Hermitian conjugate of this one. So the action for any fermion Hamiltonian is to take psi bar d3 to the time direction minus Hamiltonian. This is the rule we know. So if you put that in, it looks like this. Uh, this is like the analytic derivative, and the other one is the anti-analytic derivative, d by dz and d by dz bar, psi bar, psi bar, psi, psi. This is the source term present only at t equal to 0, where you do the destruction of the fermions. And this one is the evolution of the psi bar psi term. It looks like the usual d by d3 and the mu. But the mu is a function of x3. It, in the distant past, it has got one value. In the distant future, it has the opposite large value. So where did the k square go? Uh, the k square is there to only remind us what the sign of mu should be in the two values. Once you remember that, and you put that mu into this problem, you don't have to really keep the k square. It sets the boundary condition for what you want.
So uh, maybe I should go back one step to see what we do here. So you got a side side. Here's the main thing to notice. The current only couples to side the destruction operator, written as a graphical number here. Uh, therefore, psi bar can be integrated out. That's what I want you to notice. And psi and psi bar are independent grasp and variables. You can integrate psi bar. So you've got to complete the squares on this term uh, with that as the Gaussian action for psi bar. It couples with the d psi acting like a source. You can imagine when you complete the square, you'll get this result of a standard Gaussian integral, which look like this. Psi, that's the completing the square term. And that is this one. So this is the effective action, which if you put the j derivatives off, will give me the wave function for any number of particles I want. So now you take this d transpose d, it looks like this. This is the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian. If uh, you linearize the chemical potential near the edge, if you want, then it looks like uh, x squared plus d squared without the one half of the oscillator. So this is the guy which has a unique uh, zero energy state. This comes on all the edges of all these things. Whenever you have a non-trivial topological change, you will get the Jacquie ready mode at the edge, which you found by finally just doing the one-dimensional integral, which looks like this. So in the Euclidean mode expansion of this field side, lives in three dimensions, there's one mode with zero energy, and all the others have very high energy. So you can saturate the whole integral over all possible fields by fields that look like this. All the others are too high in energy to be of any relevance. And this function is just the wave function at the edge between uh, the empty and the filled regions. So what I'm saying is if you have to do this integral, this is a very expensive term unless you kill this term. And that is done by this unique function. Therefore, if you pick that function to be like this, which is the only function you need in low energies, then this will vanish because this will be annihilated and you'll get this. Finally, this is the action for getting the wave function. So what I'm saying is, uh, just look at the left part of this. The only life in this problem is at the edge. Everything is gap. That's what it means. The path of the growth, the only low energy states live near the edge, and all the others are very high energy states. Therefore, even though it looks like a big theory, the action is only at the interface. And this is the one single mode, which I call f, which dominates the function in the world. And when I do my rotation, you become an edge trapped in a spatial boundary. This becomes an edge in a time boundary. But Euclidean theory does not. Anyway, you know, this is just in case you want to do the final integral, uh, you will get the Fafian from doing that. But what I want to show you is not that it's a Fafian, but I want to show you that this Fafian is also the theory of the edge. All I've done so far is the more complicated way to get the BCS wave function as a Fafian by doing all these path integrals and taking derivatives. But I would, the advantage of writing this as a path integral is that now you can see this action that I wrote down can also be written in terms of Lorentz invariant terms, putting some gamma naught matrices to make psi daggers into psi bars into this thing. So this is the partition function. This is the path integral whose de derivative with respect to the source will give me my original wave functions. It is on this guy that I'm going to do uh, Lorentz transformation or the rotation. And you want to do a rotation uh, that rotates the one and the three directions. So the, the matrices you will use to perform the rotation look like this. And in our familiar language, it looks like this. And the main point I want you to notice is the most important point. Once you do that rotated theory, this also looks like a P plus IP superconductor. But this mu now will have a jump in real space. And notice that the current couples not to psi but to my on J that used to couple to psi, now it basically couples to psi plus psi diagram. So the Euclidean rotation has managed to convert the coupling to a fermion, 
the right fermion to my other fermion. This is the magic by which now you can see it's the same action. Now, if you take j derivatives, you get a correlation function of this myelin operator, this v theory, and that's the theory of the edge. So when you go from the bulk to the edge, the fermion goes from the right to myelana, and the action looks exactly the same. So this is a theory uh, with a bulk that looks just like the old bulk. It's got an edge, and the edge has a myelana fermion. But the very same j with derivatives now give you the correlation function. Yes? No, but we have to decide who is psi and who is psi bar in the old language, right? J originally coupled to psi. Okay. But in the new theory, J couples to the psi plus psi bar, where psi and psi bar define this theory in real space. So it's with respect to fermions that appear here, it is a Majorana fermion. So the rotated theory has got its own ordinary fermions, but it also got Majorana fermions at the edge. And if you wanted to couple those guys to a source, it's exactly the way you would do it. I'm telling you the partition function, the edge people would write it down, it's exactly what you're getting by the rotation. Therefore, the same z of j gives you the wave function and the correlation. I'm just going to give you one more example and then done. I want to just show you that this is not due to conformal invariance or restricted two dimensions. You can go to three dimensions where these superconductors where uh, it's like the old problem on steroids. It just got a gap function instead of being x plus i y is now a k dot sigma. So it's like a quaternion. And that's the couple, that's the way you couple the fermions in the mean field theory. The fermions got spin indices and you got to eat them up. So the gap function has got spin indices and it's got to depend on k and this is how it depends on k. So everything I did with z and z bar, now you do with this k. And uh, I don't know if I have the slides with me or not for this one. Uh, I guess I don't. Doesn't matter. Uh, what you do is you write this as a field theory and you will find it's got Lorentz invariance in 3 plus 1d. And you can do a rotation, and once again, you'll find the derivatives of the same action. On the one hand, gives you the wave functions, which is a Fathian of this kind, back to the edge theory, which also is a Fathian. So the, the summary of uh, what I've said is, uh, at least this family of theories I know, which is linear in Kx and Ky, has the property that when you do a rotation, you get another theory exactly at the same time, with the one change that what used to be an edge in time, now becomes an edge in space. And what used to be the wave function of the particles measured at that one time slice becomes the wave function of the correlation function of the fermion in the edge state. All right, I think I'll. Wave functions have gap all raw decay. Yes. You know the gap state. No, it's not a gap state at the edge is not. No, the bulk. It's the gap state. Yeah. Yeah, ask a read and read why that's okay. <laughs> You're right. No, no, they also worry about that. But yes. Can you see the similar array if you have a weaker superconductor, there are certain zero bias, zero bias peaks in certain edge directions? Yeah. That basically maps the directions in the open direction, the wave function in the open direction. The same location. I don't know the details of the Hamiltonian for the problem we have in mind, but the Hamiltonian should look, it should look like the d by dt in one language becomes a d by dx after rotation. Then it continues to be a Dirac Hamiltonian before and after. So sometimes it may not be true for the Hamiltonian. Pardon me? Yeah, it may not always have the linear structure. If it does, then it, look, all you have to do is make sure you can write it as a Dirac theory. If you can, then you can do the rotation. This one is Lorentz and Dirac. Yeah, so I don't know the Hamiltonian, so I don't know what your symmetries are. Yeah, that's the point. Usually what will happen is that the Hamiltonians will be quite different, but the edge theory will always be, look like a linear in K, the bulk theory may not look like. But there's one case where it does, yes. Uh, 
No, 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 it's not. It's the way to find the wave function. Uh, this is a very old notion. You give me, you take a vacuum, you create 10 fermions from location x1 to x10, psi diagonal acting at 10 places. You have created an anti symmetric wave function, right? I want to know what the wave function is. I then destroy fermions at 10 other points and project on the vacuum. If I got the wrong number of particles, I'll strike out, I'll get nothing. If you've got the right number and hit them in the right place, what the amplitude I've get it, it is the wave function you're actually putting in. So one way to write down the wave function is in this fashion. So you start with that and you write generating function of all possible wave functions, and that's what in the end becomes a path of difference. Unless you took that view, you won't be able to do this. It's not a physical observable. The wave functions are observable, right? To the extent wave functions are observable. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm coming up. Yes. Uh, so could you do the same for uh, just a uh, direct value which gives you uh, two or three different points of interest or not something like I don't know the problem you have in mind, but here the, the Fafian describes both the edge theory and the bulk theory. Now the problem you have in mind is a similar kind of wave function, the edge and the bulk. If it's not, then you won't be able to get them. But what it's like self-duality versus duality. There are some problems where you can guess what you can do. Take a problem <coughs> in which you got some wave function in the bulb. You do the rotation, you'll get another theory whose edge wave functions you have calculated. But it may not be the theory of the kind you started with. That's a kind of duality, but it's not self-duality. Beauty here is the rotated guy is the same guy. So you're talking with the edge of the same guy. That's the remarkable thing, is that the edge of one guy tells the whole story of the bulk wave function. And we know that if you slit the system in the middle and you do the entanglement spectrum, you can get the edge wave function. So here's what I'm saying. In these systems, you cut it with a knife, you make a measurement there, you learn all about the edge, and the edge tells you all about the bulk. So every little sliver of the space contains the information of the entire wave function. Or oh, this second aspect. So if you added the four fermion terms, it will also hold. You have to add the same. No, no, I don't because I, I couldn't do the integral to know what will happen. Yeah. I thought your result, your proof was general. Well, did you rely on the fact that it's quadratic? Oh, is it quadratic? Uh, you mean you want to take a mean field theory that add a four fermion term and see? No, not a mean field theory, an interactive theory, but Lorentz invariant. Uh, yeah. Okay, you're saying go to the whole thing and add a four fermion term. Yeah, do the rotation and see what interaction. It's a very interesting point I have not thought about. In other words, forget the fact that it came from any BCS pattern. Why me? Yeah, that depends too, right? Will it be local in time in one case? Will it be Hamiltonian theory in one other one? It may not be Hamiltonian theory. Will be local? May not be. It may not be local in that new time. Maybe local in time and spread in space for one guy would be non-local in time for the other guy. Yes, Danny? Does do all these theories have this sort of like Clifford algebra structure? Like the, yeah, the, the I have a suspicion. So you know, have four dimensions, you have eight by eight. Or so, you, know, you, may, you may have octonians, but octonians, as you know, are not associated. Yeah. They were a big favorite of my colleague, Feza, who wanted things which would not only not commute, would not be associated, would not even be combined in any way. That was his brief. So this one step short of that would be Octonian wave function. Look, quaternion we can handle, so I know what the answer is. But it may be connected. Look, it's the family of usual three division algebra, real quaternion and the third one. So that'd be a sufficiently high dimension. Okay, thank you.